Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi everyone. I'm Chining. I'm from Open Government Products. So I'm a software engineer here. And so a, a, a brief history of our team is that we are an, an outfit in the government that builds products for the public good. So how this whole thing started is that I attended JSConf earlier this year, and then I got introduced to WebAssembly. And so b before this, I only knew WebAssembly as this black box where you can write code in some other language, and then it just spits out something that you can, you can run in your browser. And, but I experimented, I experimented a bit more after the conference, and this is what I've learned. So what is this talk not about? I will not be doing a deep dive into WebAssembly. Um, I will also not be teaching you how to write WebAssembly itself. And I'm also not here to sell WebAssembly to you. I will let you make that decision on your own. Yeah, so this is what I'll actually talk about. Um, what is WebAssembly? Some, some of the benefits is, uh, and what it's good at. Some of the limitations of, the, of WebAssembly. And I'll do a bit of a demo. So if you go to WebAssembly.org, this, this is the definition you see on the website. It's not very friendly. Huh? And uh, it says high-level languages like C, C++. That's actually quite debatable. So let me break this down for you. WebAssembly is a binary instruction format. So you can think of a binary file as a catch-all term for any file that is non that, that is not that is non-text in nature. So if you try to open this file in your text editor, you'll see something like this. WebAssembly uses a stack-based virtual machine. So there are actually two parts to this term, a virtual machine and a stack. So a virtual machine is simply a program that is able to understand and interpret this binary file that you see earlier. And it, it, it's the environment that, of which this binary file can execute. So what is a stack-based virtual machine then? So your instructions are stored in a stack. And when you encounter an instruction, let's say a very simple function, add. So you, you look at this function uh, signature, it takes two elements, it takes two inputs and returns one result. So what actually happens is you pop two elements off the stack and then run this function and then push the result, one result, back onto the stack. So web assembly is designed to be portable. So what this means is that you write your code once, you, you compile it, and then you can ship it to any, any other environment. Anything that runs a web browser is able to run WebAssembly, and that's pretty universal. So WebAssembly is a target for compilation. What this means is that you don't actually write WebAssembly itself, you write it in another language, compile it to WebAssembly. So why might, we, why might you want to use WebAssembly? This is usually the first point you see when anyone introduces WebAssembly to you. So it's, it's known for its sheer speed and performance, usually by an order of magnitude over JavaScript. You are no longer limited by JavaScript in your browser. So traditionally, when you, when you want to have any logic in your browser, you have your, own, your only option is JavaScript. But since now you are able to use other languages, compile it for your, compile it to WebAssembly, you are able to run these languages in your browser. And this also expands, this also exposes WebAssembly to more developers, and they can ship their products to the, web, to the, to the browser. You, one uh, less obvious benefit you can see is the elimination of network calls. So what this means is that your rewrites are not limited to your client side. You can take code that actually runs on the server and try and try to rewrite this thing and put, and write it in and, and run it on your browser. And sometimes you don't even have to do a rewrite because if if your code is something like C you can attempt to just compile that that block of code and and import it into your browser. So yeah, you can port whole applications, whole de desktop applications to your browser. An example of this is actually AutoCAD. They're very they have ported their entire desktop application onto the browser. So here is an illustration of some of the points, uh, some, some of the benefits that I've, I've mentioned earlier. This, so Clusterful, this is a project that I worked on last year. Um, it's born out of Beeline. So Beeline is one of, our, one of the products that our team make. You can think of it as, um, you can think of it as school buses for adults. So one of the problems we face 
in Beeline was that planning routes was difficult because all the data that came into Beeline is aggregated in the form of an Excel file. And it's very difficult to actually view what the demand for certain bus routes are. So the solution that I came up with was to build a dashboard to visualize all this, all this demand, all, all the demand for the routes. So it looks something like this. Um, yeah, so this is a diagram of how it looks like. Uh, yeah, so you, you can select a point on the map, uh, and then this, you run it, it computes where the clusters are. So you select a, des a destination indicated by that green point on the map, and then this, yeah, this takes a while. And then you can see for this point, for this green point, this, this somewhere in Changi, you can see that there's a lot of demand for bus routes coming from this area that looks like Tampanese. Yeah, so behind Clusterful is this clustering algorithm that um, I, this is the part that I actually rewrote. So um, before it took, the, a single invocation, you, you saw that it took actually very long to run. So a single invocation took three seconds to run. I, I put this from our backend logs. And after which we imported it to WebAssembly, it took 75 milliseconds. This is a, a very huge speed improvement to me. So I've illustrated that in Clusterful, this code, the before image, this code originally, it resides in a server. I've taken this code, rewrote re it in Rust, and then imported it in the browser. So you not, only, you not only have the performance benefit, but you also completely eliminate this whole network call incurred when you make a, a call to the, to, the, to the endpoint on the server. So you're thinking, yeah, this is really cool. Can I use WebAssembly? Turns out that it's already being supported in ma most major browsers today. So there's a, there's a list of uh, compatible languages, um, and whether or not a language is supported, whether or not a language you can write, you can compile it to WebAssembly, it, de it depends on whether people have created this compilation to change for them. So loading WebAssembly is um, you, you, you can just load your WebAssembly with just these six lines of code. Um, and here I'll try, I'll try, uh, I'll attempt a live coding. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. So, um, uh, C++, C++ code on top, and um, I'll, I'll attempt to compile. So, I, I, I pre-compiled this code, so C++ on top, and this is how you load it in your browser. Okay. So, okay, I'll, I'll explain more in depth what this code does. So, you can load WebAssembly using this fetch API, um, and then uh, ignore the second line, I'll, I'll explain that later. Uh, and then, so you, instanti you instantiate this in, in your browser. Uh, you, can, you, you can treat this as any other, you can treat your WebAssembly module like any other JavaScript module, so you need to instantiate it. And then here I'm just assigning the module, the instance, to this demo variable in the browser. So when I attempt to run this, um, <laughs> so you'll see that you have an object, and this is your addition function. So if you, if you try and run this, three, five, you should get eight. And yeah, here. You've got an eight. So you'll be thinking, why did I not start with a hello world? Um, as it turns out, hello world in WebAssembly is actually non-trivial. Right? Trying to write it, trying to write your code in C and then loading it in WebAssembly is actually non-trivial. So let me let me illustrate this by doing the same thing. The code is very similar. I'm just changing. I'm just swapping out the variables. So. So you see, instead of uh, instead of getting the result hello world, I'm I'm getting back the number sixteen. So why is this so? 
So we have to look at how WebAssembly is, is managed in the browser. So WebAssembly, um, it, memory in WebAssembly is a linear contiguous block of bytes. So what this means is that it's, it's, you can think of it as, as, a, as a linear, as a conti continuous block of, block of bytes, and this illustrated by, uh, this represented by JavaScript's array buffer data structure. And another caveat about it is that uh, it's sandbox. So remember that it, remember that WebAssembly is remember that we have to instantiate a WebAssembly module. So every every instance, every block of bytes here is inaccessible by other other instances. So does this uh, one of the things that actually um, caught me by surprise about WebAssembly is that it only supports numeric types, and that explains why you could you are not able to return hello world. So Apparently, if you want to if you want to do any input and output, if you want to feed any input into WebAssembly module and retrieve any results, you are only able to do so with numbers. And if you want any other types, you need to carry out pointer ar arithmetic. So yeah, here's a diagram that illustrates this. So if you are if you want to feed in an input called hello, you have to you have to convert hello to ASCII, which is a numeric format. Figure out how many bytes in memory this would take up and then and then find out what the start position in memory this is what the offset of this is and then you have to stop you have to persist this somewhere in your application so not that easy huh yeah but there are existing two chains that do this for you um, so there are real libraries that generate this thing called the glue code for you so this glue code um, it comes in the form of a JS file which you instead call instead of so you call you make your calls through this JS file instead of going through the WebAssembly module directly. So let's come back to this um, demo of Hello World. Um, so I, yeah, so C++ code on the left, and um, when you compile it to, when you compile C++ to WebAssembly, um, there's this thing called a WAT file. This is an intermediate format, um, which, which represents how it looks like it actually in memory. So the, the part that I want to highlight is over here. Um, you, see the, you see the 16 and hello world. So what this means is that hello world, you can find this thing at position, at position 16 in your memory. So let me go back to the demo. So what I've done here, remember that I assigned it to the hello variable, um, and then I'm I'm accessing the memory directly. So this is your uh, this is your array buffer in JavaScript memory, where of which this WebAssembly module is being loaded into. So uh, this this thing is simply to cast it uh, so so that you can see what the output is like. So if you look at the output buffer, you'll see that this is actually the ASCII uh, ASCII representation of hello world. And I can prove this to you by running this. And yeah, here's the result. So apart from this whole funky pointer arithmetic thing, um, another limitation of WebAssembly is that you do not actually have access to the DOM. So remember that I said WebAssembly, everything is uh, isolated. So what this means is that you, you are only able to make calls within WebAssembly itself and, and functions within WebAssembly do not have access to anything on the outside. So your only entry and exit points are your parameter inputs and your return types. Module size. So if you are, if you are writing a C++ module, sometimes you have, or if you are writing anything in any language, sometimes you have a lot of dependencies and um, you have to be mindful of this if you are if you are compiling it to WebAssembly, because you have actually have to load everything in memory, and and sometimes you also have to ship these things over a network. So if your module is actually very big, um, it might not be very data friendly. There's very limited uh, support for threading. So uh, they had it. Uh, I think they had progress at one point uh, with JavaScript shared array buffer, but then they had to reverse that thing because uh, they had to reverse that decision because there were essentially some security issues with with it. Garbage collection. This is uh, a feature on the roadmap, but it's not yet implemented. 
So what this means is that if you are writing your code in a language like Java, you have to ship the entire garbage collector along with your binary, and this is, not, this is really not ideal. And debugging across different languages, so you are writing your code in one language, and you get your errors in another. So let's say you write your WebAssembly module in Rust, but you see your, your, you see your errors in JavaScript. So this really depends on what kind of toolings you have available to debug these sort of stack traces. And security concerns. So what you have now is a binary file. It's much, much harder to inspect a binary file. You have to reverse engineer it, as opposed to having just a JavaScript file where you can actually view the source. So you'll be thinking, what happens to JavaScript in this case? As, as it turns out, um, WebAssembly and JavaScript, they are not at all with each other. So JavaScript still has a very rich ecosystem, which you can, which you can and should leverage on. So there are a lot of JavaScript libraries um, for like DOM manip manipulation. So remember I said WebAssembly, it does not have access to the DOM. So if you, are, if you want to do any front-end work, you are still probably going to stick to your libraries like Vue.js, React. And you should, only, you should use WebAssembly at what it's good at. So for example, WebAssembly is very good at computation, so you want to leverage on that. So yes, they are meant to augment each other, and they are not at odds with each other. So should you use WebAssembly? Um, it's not supported by Internet Explorer, so if you have to support that, you are, not, uh, you are out of luck. Um, and you should really look at whether you have a need for this thing. So remember that interfacing with DOM is slow. I, I, I said that if you, if you want to access anything from within WebAssembly to the outside, it's not possible. So any, any form of interaction you have with your DOM has to go through, that, has, has to go through your function parameters and your return type. So, and, and, that's, and, and at this point, it's still very slow to do that. And also, you have to, you have to realize that when you are loading a WebAssembly module, you, you have to, you have to inc there's an overhead incurred. So if this overhead is more significant than actually your computation, then it's probably not worth it. So really go and profile and identify what kind of bottlenecks your system has, and then, and then figure that out on your own. And in terms of community support, um, WebAssembly, in the past, it, it was, it's relatively new, so I, I think it came out in 2017. So uh, in the past, it may have been much harder to actually uh, find solutions to your problems. So my personal takeaway from this whole thing is that actually do not be afraid of getting your hands dirty. Um, if, you want, if you want to play with something new, just, just dive in and try and break things. If, if when you break things, you start googling solutions, and then eventually you'll find out how everything works. Yeah, and that's, I would like to give a shout out to my team at Open Government Products, which, uh, which helped me, who helped me review my slides and gave me a lot of feedback. Uh, and then all these other people, which, which have, uh, there are a lot of resources, very, very good introduction to WebAssembly here. here. Yep, that's the end of my talk.